Yeah, I'm giving a talk. Um, I am going to tell you about Flask, which is a simple web framework written in Python. Um, and it's a web framework that I like because I think it's simple and Pythonic. And as someone who doesn't really do that much web dev, I appreciate it as a nice, simple way to make websites. I think it's, I can recommend it to people who are not necessarily web devs or want to really get into web dev, but just want to like throw up a quick page, have it work. Um, yeah, so I used to work in web dev a bunch of times um, and most, mostly just adding things to existing systems, existing frameworks. Um, but about a year or a couple of years ago, for the first time, I had an opportunity to make a little web app from start to end, um, all, all the layers. So I had the opportunity to actually select a web framework that I preferred for the first time. Um, so I selected Flask. Um, what is Flask? It's a simple web framework. It is similar to projects like web.py or bottle. It's essentially the same kind of syntax. Um, I've discovered web.py many years ago. And when I wanted to do something like that again, I discovered that it was kind of obsolete. Nobody used it anymore. Um, later, there was another project called bottle, but that has now been superseded by Flask. And people still seem to be using Plus, Flask, so I guess it's still a good idea. Um, <coughs> Flask is built on top of, it incorporates other projects and it's built on top of them. It uses Vectoic for the WSGI layer. That's how you get it to talk to Apache um, when you get there. Um, but you don't need to worry about that at the start. And it uses Jinja 2 for templating, but you can also use it with Genshi or other things. It just uses Jinja 2 by default, and I saw no reason not to use that. Um, why Flask? Um, it has a very clean syntax. It has relatively little boilerplate, and it's pretty easy to set up. It comes with a built-in little demo web server. You probably want, wouldn't want to run your entire site on it, but it's really great to just run the file, have the site pop up, and you can test it without messing around. It's got a debug mode, so it, um, it's very helpful when you're developing to have it print out what is actually going on if something goes wrong. Um, so this is Hello World in Flask. Um, now just a basic, some basic concepts about um, writing a website in a language like Python. Uh, if you have a static website full of HTML pages, every page you go to is an actual page. It's a file on your, in, in some kind of tree of files, and what you request is exactly what you get from the tree. And to some extent, PHP apps, at, at least at the start, kind of followed the same model. So instead of an HTML page, you have a PHP page, which corresponds to every HTML page, and that gives you an HTML page. Um, but um, if you want to write an app, if you want to write a web, web app in, in Python, you kind of have to move away from that very literal model. And um, what you have, what you actually write in, in a framework like this is just a mapping. You have a mapping of paths that you would request, request on your web server, and then an application will somehow produce something for that path, but there isn't, there isn't necessarily actually any file anywhere or any actual file system tree. This is all just one file. Um, so this is a simple example of um, how Flask works. There's a bunch of setup stuff over here, um, import stuff, you create an app, and this is how you define your mappings. So you have a function which returns something. Pretend that this is HTML code, it isn't actually, but it'll display, it'll display in a browser and show you something. Um, and we want this to display when the user goes to the root of your web application. So you use this decorator called app.root, which essentially maps this path to this function with this output. And then this over here will start the little demo <coughs> web server um, and show you how this works. So I have some examples that I prefer prepared earlier. Um, So that file contains basically this. I deliberately left red out of these slides because I wasn't sure if we were going to have any. Now if I can see where my mouse is. Where's my mouse? Where's my OK, here it is, right. OK. And so that web server told us um, what port it was running on in our local machine, and we go to this port, and it should say, hello world, which you can't see because it's scrolled off the screen. Um, but yeah, there it is. OK. Where is it? Why can't I find where the oh, Here we go. Right. Um, so that's not a very useful app. And also, it's not very useful because it's not actually producing HTML. Um, 
and that is not something to be encouraged. So something, in, what pe a lot of people do in PHP is just intersperse like HTML in their file with PHP code, and then it's, it, it doesn't look nice. Um, so a nicer way of doing this sort of thing is to use a template. So you have what is essentially a, almost like a static HTML page, but possibly broken up into little pieces, and then you use some kind of dynamic stuff to assemble your page out of these bits. Um, and Ginger 2 is one of these engines. Um, Genshi is also quite popular. And we can use um, a simple template to actually make a proper HTML page which says hello world. Um, so this is over here, the simple style sheet. This is a very, very minimal HTML page, but I am told this is actually a proper HTML page. Um, and um, you can obviously, you want to start your page with a style sheet. And this is a, sorry, this is, um, so any static pages that you actually have um, in your application go in a particular directory, and then you use some um, special dynamic stuff for actually loading stuff from that directory so you can find it. Um, and if we have a look at this, we can run our nice new example. And now, if we reload this, here we go. Here's our proper HTML page. You can view source, it'll be HTML. So what is next? So far, this is all pretty static. Um, but you can add variable parts to your application, obviously. You can, so you can have this little function print a variable message that you submit to the app instead of just hello world. So here we're mapping both of these routes to this application and we are setting a default parameter for message. So if message exists, it'll get filled in here. If it doesn't exist, we're just going to use the default and we're going to render it using the same template. So now, if we just go there with no parameters, it does the same thing but we can also type something in there. Whoops. Did I, did I forget to run it? I forgot to run it, sorry. That is example three. There we go. There, so we put in a variable. Um, Um, do we know what post and get parameters are? Anyone? No. Okay, so that's how it's how you, you send information to a web server. If you fill in a form and it sends some stuff, it generally use, uses post. If you see in your URL question mark and then blah equals whatever, and those are get parameters. Um, so you don't actually have to specify anything if you just want to use get because that's on by default. But here, as an example, I've, you can specify that you would also like this, this URL to use post parameters. Um, so now we're going to um, now we're going to pass in the message in in the actual request parameters. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Where did you get request from? Request is I think I believe it's a it's something you import from Flask at the top of your file. Um, in fact, we can have a look. I think this is example four. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that yeah, they're in the, the bar that you can't quite see because it's running into yeah, the black. Yeah. You are in fact importing a request from Flask. So it's a, it's a thing you import from Flask. <coughs> so now, can. do that with that and message equals hello, which I've already done before. And there we go. So we've, we've achieved essentially the same thing, but um, using request parameters. I'm going to do a call now and post it. Hmm? <laughs> OK. Um, so 
Something which is important to remember when you're writing web apps is that what you don't get for free is persistence. Because when you're writing, when you write a normal desktop application, um, there's a process, it runs for one user, it's all very linear, you maybe have an event loop, but it's all like one process, all the data hangs around, you don't have to do anything, you just obviously get persistence because it's there. Um, but web apps don't work like that because they're built on top of web pages, which weren't really designed for this purpose, but we've done an amazing job of mutating them into this thing that can do anything. So you ask a web server for a page and it gives you one, and then sometime later you ask it for a page again, it gives you one, but it doesn't know that those are both your pages and there's something going on there. There are lots of users requesting pages. So the web, you need, your app needs to be able to identify you and somehow get your persistent data and your history and where you are in the app. So unfortunately you have to do that yourself. So um, something you can do is store some data in browser cookies. Um, so there's, there's some session stuff. There, there's session stuff built into Flask, and it's relatively simple. Um, so you can, the session is exposed as something which looks like a dictionary, but as we all heard today, just because something is a dictionary, looks like a dictionary, doesn't mean it's actually a dictionary. Um, so this is actually saving stuff to like a cookie. Um, so it's serializing things, saving to a cookie. I'm pretty sure the serialization happens by default, I think, it just does it for you in the background. But this does mean that you can't take an enormous object and just put it in there, because that's not gonna work, because you only have 4K to work with, I think. Um, so this is how you, you can get something from the, from the session. And so, so now our, our default route is going to either print hello world or whatever message was saved in the session. But we have to put a message in the session or it'll never be anything other than hello world. So we're going to make another, another route with another little function which puts the message that we have, we have specified um, in the session. And um, this is a, a key which is used for encrypting the sessions so that the, they can't be tampered with. Um, so, let's just see what this looks like. Also, it would help to actually run this. So now if we go to the the main page, it prints, oh, because I saved that earlier. So currently that's what's in my session. If we want to change that message, we go to, what did I say it was? What, no, that's the, I've forgotten my own slides, it's unfortunate. What did I say? Slash message, okay, that's, so now, if we put something else in here, like and then if we go to the main page again, it will read this from our session and it'll say like that forever until we change it to something else. So um, yeah, there's a size limit of 4K. So don't pickle your entire state of your application to put it in there because it's not going to work. It will not be obvious why it doesn't work because apparently this is so obvious they don't even give you an error message that tells you you're being an idiot. Um, so there are various ways of, obviously the data that you want to persist is unlikely to actually fit within 4K. So there are various ways to work around this. Um, some people have effectively server-side sessions. So they, they pickle all the data, they put it somewhere like a database or something, and then all they put in your cookie is some kind of ID and then goes fetches it. And some people swear by this, some people think it's terrible, but it's a thing you can do. Um, but what you can also do is sometimes you can kind of recreate all your objects and stuff you're working with from a relatively minimal um, set of information. Um, I ended up building my, my application to a database, so I didn't actually need to worry that much about this because everything was sort of stored there already. Okay, so how do you actually make this app do stuff? Um, how do you make it do things <coughs> when the user clicks on things? So um, obviously a lot, of, a lot of web app stuff happens in JavaScript. Um, traditionally this is, well, local um, user side scripting. Uh, which has now pretty much become JavaScript. Um, that's, you can modify bits of the page without ever talking to a server because all the information is there and you can, you can use what, what is already on the user's computer and that's relatively fast. Um, traditionally, you use things like forms to submit data to the server. 
um, except old school websites, you would fill in a form and click a button, would post everything and regenerate a whole web page with new information on it. Uh, but now we use something, most web apps that are modern use something called Ajax, which is a fancy way for JavaScript that talks to your server. Um, the idea is that you have some stuff that can happen locally, um, and some of the JavaScript that's on the page can talk to the server to request a small fragment of information and changes something on your page dynamically, and you don't have to keep reloading the whole page. It's relatively fast, relatively responsive. Um, so you can do Ajax in, um, in Flask. This is a very simple example. We're going to scramble the message when the user clicks on a button. So you need essentially three parts for this. You need the actual thing in the template, which um, puts the elements there that things are going to happen to. Um, you need your JavaScript for doing stuff on the client side, and you need server-side handling for what the JavaScript is going to ask for. So this, we're going to use jQuery for this. If you don't know anything about JavaScript and you've never used it before and you want to do some simple JavaScript stuff, I highly recommend that you look at a high-level library like jQuery because it may save you a lot of pain, even if it may seem like overkill. Um, jQuery gives you a sort of CSS-like interface to add JavaScript to your page. Um, you kind of use selectors, and then you say, I want elements with this class to have this function and stuff like that. Um, it's a lot nicer in many cases than fiddling around with low-level JavaScript. Um, so here, we're just going to load jQuery from our static directory, and we're going to load our custom JavaScript. And yeah, this is just, this just saves a, a script root variable which will be important in our JavaScript data. And the important thing here is that we're making a, an element, which is the ID scramble, and this is what the user is going to click on to scramble the message. Um, also, elsewhere on this page is the actual message, which we have seen earlier, and is therefore omitted. Um, so this is, this is the JavaScript. Um, it's not very pretty. It has a fair bit of boilerplate. But essentially, what this does is it takes the element with ID scramble. And when you click on that element, it executes a function which gets the element called message and gets the text on that element and sends it to this path in your application and then gets some JSON back and it's some JSON data and the data has the scrambled message inside it and then it uses it replaces the text in, in that message with what you got back. Um, if you exclude the boilerplate, that's basically what it says. Um, and then this is the very pretty Python backend with very few brackets. Um, so this is relatively simple. So now you make a, a route in your app for this scramble action. And you know that you're going to get a message in the argument. So you get that message. Then you make it into a list, and you shuffle it, and you put it back into a string. And then you send it back. Um, JSONify is a built-in thing in Flask for making JSON objects out of, um, I think, like simple list of Python things. Um, Okay, and now I will show you how this all works. So there's the, the element with the message, and there's the element with the button, which you can now click on and it scrambles it, and scrambles it. And the only thing it replaces is this little bit over here, and doesn't do anything else with the rest of the page, and doesn't reload. The magic of Ajax. Um, so this was obviously a very toy example. Um, if you want more information, you can go to flask.puku.org. You can go to the Puku channel and Freenode. Everyone who works on Flask is very nice and answers your questions, is very nice. If you remember Armin Ronneher who gave the keynote from last year's PyCon, he works on this stuff. So it's like cool stuff. Um, and now I will show you a real example, which is what I actually used this for most recently. I just need to find it. Okay. So what I actually use this for is a curriculum planning tool, which was commissioned by, I think, the Faculty of Science. The faculty was someone. Someone told me to do it. Um, yeah, it's complicated. And now I will see if I can 
actually remember all the parameters. So this is a very, it's a relatively small app. Um, all the Flask stuff is essentially in one page called pages, or well, one file called pages.py. Um, and I'm, it's built on top of a database. I'm using SQLite, so I have to specify this as a parameter. Yay, that's even in the same place. So the point of this tool, okay, it's not what it normally looks like. I think I just had a CSS file called the same thing inconveniently. <coughs> okay, this would be a lot prettier if you could see the two things side by side, but I think the screen is unfortunately too narrow for that. Um, but normally they're next to each other. Um, so. The idea is that the, you use this tool for planning an undergraduate curriculum for a particular person. So you can select majors that you want them to have in your curriculum, like computer science. And it gets filled in on this little timetable um, in the appropriate time slot. And it's both lectures and practicals. And you can add, let's add another major like chemistry fastest and then when you have things clashing you can move them to different days so that they don't clash anymore and there are all kinds of rules about um, how many credits you have to have by minimum for the course to, for the, to meet the degree requirements how many you're allowed to have within a year so you don't exceed the maximum and over here it gives you like messages saying that you don't have enough credits um, giving you information which isn't handled by, by this and telling you about recommended requisites and stuff. And here it tells you what courses you currently have. It just take them away both over here and over there and it shows you a kind of visual representation of what's going on. Um, yeah, so this was all done entirely in Flask um, with a SQL object backend and a bit of jQuery on top to make everything to go around and work. So you can really use Flask for real things, and it's useful. And it was, it was pretty easy to learn. I didn't really, apart from the hilarious session misadventure, I didn't really encounter any major blockages when working with Square Framework. So if you're looking for a very simple thing that you want to learn really quickly and make a nice website in, I can recommend Flask. And that is my talk. Awesome. Um, question time. It's going to start us off. Should we go, Andre? Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 that'll be cool. Um, except I'm not sure if debug is turned on, and I'm not sure if I can actually break this <laughs> to give you an exception. But yeah, you're, okay, let's see that, because I think, yeah, I think default is, the, I think it's actually on by default. So let us go and, where's my mouse? Yeah, um, actually, where am I going? I don't need the slides. Okay, so let's cancel that. Um, Defect is on. And now, here we go. It's running. Now, we go here. Okay, no, that was this. I think debug isn't on. Wait, it, do you just say debug equals true? I think you do. In app.run. So you put debug oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in there. Is this all caps or small letters? Mm -hmm. Boom, there we go. And it gives you a lovely stack trace and tells you exactly where you screwed up. You can even click in there. Yeah. Can you? Sweet. Yeah. Well, you can. Here we go. 
Nice. Mm -hmm. That. Cool. There you go. So this is it's very useful for debugging. Another one at the back, yeah. Um, I think that depends on how big your application is. Um, this is, so even the curriculum planner is a very small application. It's only really one page and like a couple of commands that do Ajaxy stuff. So there's no <laughs> real reason to put, to like split that up into files. And um, there is, it's generally a good idea to try and separate different layers of your code as much as possible. So I have the kind of, um, my model stuff is kind of intertwined with my database layer because SQL object kind of works like that. It sort of, it abstracts away database stuff into your objects. Um, but um, that's, that's all that model stuff is separate from the Flask stuff, which, which works the web app. Essentially, it calls out to an object. And sometimes there's, there's a kind of an API on the object which is called from the, from the Flask layer, but I don't put it all in, in like one, one giant file. Um, but um, obviously, if you have like a more complicated web app with like multiple pages and stuff, you should, I think it's a good idea to split things up logically, but not into overly small pieces just for the sake of splitting it up too much. Like some people put like a class per file, that's, that's a bit much. Um, but you kind of have to use your own judgment for like that kind of stuff. Yes, I think. I mean, there's, there's authentication stuff you can do, which I kind of briefly, briefly looked into. Um, there's, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent there's like stuff built in, but it's relatively, if you, there are a lot of recipes and kind of code examples on the Flask webpage which show you how to do like various kinds of things. And I'm pretty sure that they have authentication examples there as well. So I think it's, it's relatively easy to do. Yeah. Anybody else? Hmm? Can you post two examples somewhere? Yes. Um, this this talk is up somewhere, but I'll put it up properly, like somewhere where people can put it. Okay. Okay. If there's no more, I think we're good. We've got five minutes to go. Thank you, Adriana.